Hey art nerds, not too long ago I hosted a live stream where I showed you guys how to color this beautiful poinsettia using watercolor markers. Before that, I released a tutorial showing you how to draw and ink this poinsettia. I'm going to link that in the description below, as well as in the cards in case you'd like to draw along with me. Now, if you'd like to just color along instead, there will also be a link down in the description below where you can purchase and print this line art. If you're one of my fantastic patrons on Patreon, you get this line art free. So the materials we're using today are Canson XL watercolor sketchbook. This has been inked using a Pentel pigment brush pen and a Sakura Pigma FB brush pen. We're also using the 20 pack plus some additional colors of the Faber Castell Albrecht Durer watercolor markers. These are India ink based watercolor markers, so they're gonna be extremely light fast. We're also using the old body of the Winsor Newton watercolor markers. I believe those are now sold as the Winsor Newton Pro Marker watercolor markers or maybe Pro Marker Aqua markers. They're basically the same marker, just with a different branding on the exterior. You're also going to need a cup of clean water. I would recommend having a paint puck in your cup of clean water to scrub your brush as you go. A ceramic plate, you can get this from just plain old Dollar Tree. It doesn't have to be a fancy ceramic plate. We're gonna use this for our color mixing and I'll demonstrate that in a moment. You're also gonna need various watercolor brushes. Synthetic is fine, as well as a paper towel. I'm going to link the full time lapse in case you guys are curious. I will say though that the dry times in that time lapse took quite a long time. So uh, you may prefer to work in this condensed time lapse version instead. So to begin, I scrubbed a light cool yellow from Windsor Newton onto my plate and I used my brush with a little bit of water to create a wash. This is great for covering larger areas with less saturated versions of the watercolor marker. And I'm doing all of the background poinsettia leaves. If you guys have ever looked really closely at a poinsettia, you'll notice that the red quote unquote petals of the poinsettia aren't petals at all, they're just red leaves. The poinsettia I'm painting and I'm working from Google Images so I'm working from a bunch of different poinsettia references and I'm taking the elements that I like the best but some of them had these green leaves that have these bright yellow veins and that was something I really wanted to capture so I'm doing an underpainting using yellow first. I've used the same technique of scrubbing my watercolor marker onto my ceramic plate and then adding water to create a background wash using a cool phthalo blue for the background. These are gonna be our background leaves or you could leaf, leaf this as is. Now the ceramic plate is really key in this because when you're working with watercolor markers, you're getting the most saturated, you're getting the mass tone of each color, which can, if you work with that exclusively, become quite overwhelming. And while you can do some blending out with your watercolor markers, there's only so far you can take it. So that's why I like utilizing a non-porous surface like a ceramic plate. You could also use some glossy scrap plastic or even like the Teflon coating that I have on my desk here would make for a great, just kind of scratch work surface. So for the poinsettia itself, those red leaves, I wanna do an underpainting using purple to create a little bit of shadow. 
So if I'd applied my purple directly to the paper, that would have been a lot of color in one place. So we apply it to the paint, uh, to the plate, mix in a little bit of water and then paint it into our poinsettia. And then we allow that to dry. For the center of the poinsettia, I'm using a warmer yellow from Albrecht Durer and I'm using my Winsor Newton and my Albrecht Durer watercolor markers kind of interchangeably since this is my video and I can use whatever supplies I want to use. But both of these are watercolor markers that utilize pigment rather than utilizing dyes like the echo line markers or the Karen markers. While those definitely have their place, pigment markers can be much easier to work with and much more similar to a traditional painting experience. I feel that the dye based watercolor markers are a lot more like messing around with alcohol markers than they are like messing around with watercolors. So I've applied some of that yellow directly to the veins. And speaking of a direct application, we're gonna go in now with Albrecht Durer's leaf green. So we're using kind of a, it could also be called like a spring green or a sap green. It is a cooler, lighter green. And we're doing direct application onto our cellulose watercolor paper and then blending it out using a little bit of clean water. And I'm trying to leave the veins in the center of each leaf still open. And I'm also stopping before I get to the edge of each leaf. Now, while that's still wet, I'm directly applying Thalo Green Dark from Albrecht Durer and then blending that out using our leaf green color. So one of the things about direct application with watercolor markers, and it, this can happen on any kind of paper, we're working on a cellulose paper today, is that if you overwork your paper, if you over, over scrub your paper while it's still wet, you're gonna start to debray or degrade your paper surface. You're gonna get abrasions and you're gonna start to get pilling. And I did notice that while I was painting this. So that's something you're gonna wanna keep an eye out for and you kind of, want to allow the paper to dry and kind of recover itself before you add too, too many layers. That's another reason I utilize a ceramic plate for some of my mixing is to save my paper surface some wear and tear as I go. So towards the end of working on that leaf, I added in a little bit of Winsor & Newton Indigo. Doesn't have to be Winsor & Newton Indigo, and I can tell that was a marker I let my students use because it's basically destroyed. They mushed that thing to death. And that's one of my other problems with the watercolor markers that are on the market, with the exception of the Echo Line and Karen markers, is most watercolor markers on the market utilize a fiber brush tip rather than a foam brush tip. And these fiber brush tips are very prone to fraying, to breaking down. You can't really apply that much pressure to them. So if you like doing, say, brush calligraphy, these are gonna break down much faster than brush tips that utilize a foam rubber brush tip. So I'm basically repeating the same techniques for all of the bright green leaves, the ones that are currently painted yellow, surrounding the base flower or the base red petals. Base red leaves, gosh, Becca poinsettias. They're challenging. Not that they're challenging to draw. They're fairly easy to draw. They're just challenging to talk about. So again, a direct application with our lightest leaf green stopping right before we get to the edges of the petals. Then we're gonna blend that out using clean water. Then we're gonna go in with a darker, cooler green, in this case, phthalo green dark, mostly rendering in the shadows. And I'm gonna blend that back out with our leaf green. And then finally, we're gonna add some more shadows using our indigo blue. And we're gonna blend that back out with the phthalo green dark. And you guys can see I'm using the Albrecht Durer and the Winsor Newton watercolor markers basically interchangeably. I would not do this between say dye based watercolor markers and pigment based watercolor markers, but I would do it in between different brands of dye based watercolor markers. And part of that is I would just be afraid that the pigments might ruin the dye brush tips. <laughs> 
So I'm going to continue this technique for the other three leaves. And I wanna point out that with watercolor, including watercolor marker, a lot of it is you apply a layer, you let it dry, and then you see how you feel about it. And you might make some tweaks, you might make some changes. With this piece, I end up doing a lot of repainting and making changes, but I wanna normalize that. It's perfectly normal to do something with art, whether it's acrylic, watercolor, drawing, whatever. Give it some time, think about it, and then tweak it or change it or just completely redraw it or repaint it. And I think that's something we don't necessarily demonstrate enough. So now that all of my foreground brighter leaves are painted, I'm gonna go into the background. I've applied some of that indigo color to my plate and I'm painting that into the background here as a wash. And while that dries, I'm going to go into the center of my poinsettia using some brighter, warmer yellows. So I did a direct application with the marker and then I blended it out using a little bit of clean water. So now that my leaves have had more of a chance to, tr to dry, it's time to fiddle with them. And I decided that they just weren't really dark enough. They were too bright, they were too light. So I'm going in with more of the leaf green and I'm gonna go in with more of the dark phthalo green and more of the indigo to build up those colors. <laughs> 
But first, I'm going to render the background a bit more. So I want a looser, wet into wet kind of leaf background. So I'm just scribbling in some dark phthalo green, and then I'm just kind of blending it, washing it out using a little bit of clean water. And before that dries completely, I want to go in with some indigo as well and get kind of some mottled wet into wet. Now, part of the problem with working with cellulose paper is that your water doesn't actually sink into the paper. Your pigments don't actually sink into the paper. They just sit on the surface. So your dry time is totally dependent by your atmospheric humidity. And I had the heater cranked up this evening. So while some of my dry times ended up taking quite a long time when the water finally saturated the paper in the beginning, my dry times were a little more difficult to control because so much water was escaping into the atmosphere. So um, it was a little harder for me to control the wet into wet the way I would like to. Now, if you're painting on a cotton rag paper, and those do take watercolor markers differently. Some artists like how watercolor markers handle on cotton rag paper. I'm not such a big fan, I'll tell you guys why. So with cotton rag paper, your water and your pigments end up soaking into the paper surface. Now this might not be true with a hot press. I haven't experimented with a hot press yet, but I find it to be true with cold presses. So I don't get as much movement as I might like. So while the background is wet, I'm going in and I'm dabbing in more of the phthalo green dark and more of the indigo. And you wanna be careful because when your paper surface is wet like this, it's really susceptible to getting torn up and getting abraded by those brush tips. So at this point, I decided that this is still looking too color by numbers for me, too coloring book, just too straightforward. So I spritzed it with some clean water in a spritzer bottle just to get some movement with the pigments, to get some flow and to get a little bit of chaos going on because that's one of the things I like about watercolor is the opportunity for texture and chaos that you can't necessarily get if you're using alcohol markers. And while that's drying, I'm going to start working on our actual poinsettia, the red part of this plant. So I've selected three different bright reds from the Albrecht Durer line. I believe we have a cadmium red or it might be a scarlet red. We have a geranium red and then we have a magenta that we're going to use for the base flower. And I painted a wash of our lightest red. I applied that right to the plate and then I applied that to our flower. And I'm applying that over the purple initial toning wash. <laughs> 
So while that's drying, I'm gonna use that as an opportunity to evaluate some of the other parts of our illustration and add in a little bit more yellow to the veins of the leaves since that got a little bit lost when I added the spray bottle water to it. I'm also applying a little bit of the leaf green to the actual florets in the center of the poinsettia. So while the red continues to dry, I'm going into our foreground green leaves and adding in more color, kind of adjusting the color balance and how much highlight we get with these. So one of the things about watercolor markers as well, particularly the pigment based ones is I believe they're using glycerin as one of the binders. And the thing about glycerin is if you apply too much glycerin to your paper, and this is something that those of you who might have used say Crayola washable watercolors, children's watercolors that are designed to wash out of clothing tend to use a lot of glycerin, you'll notice that you get a buildup on the paper surface, which makes it difficult to apply more color and basically makes it impossible to apply watercolor pencil on top. So if you were hoping to apply watercolor pencil to your illustration at some point and you're using watercolor markers, that's definitely something you wanna keep in mind. Initially, I'd wanted to go back into the leaves and do a light dusting of white watercolor pencil to kind of show how shiny poinsettia leaves can sometimes be to show the light reflecting off of the high points of the leaves. But by the time I finished this illustration, there was just too much glycerin sitting on the surface of the paper. So I wanted to darken these leaves a bit more as well since my reference shows that most poinsettia have darker green leaves. Now I wanted to create that foreground and background leaf contrast. I wanted to create some depth. So that was important to establish early on with our brighter greens and our yellow greens. But now it's time to just kind of continue to fiddle with it. So I'm also adding more indigo and more dark phthalo green to our background leaves. I'm also continuing to work our foreground leaves, adding in more, more dark phthalo green and more indigo. And I apologize for my head getting into the shot. It's a little bit difficult to see what I'm doing sometimes because I have all these studio lights and they're casting a lot of reflection. So it can make it difficult to accurately gauge color. So now that our red poinsettia leaves have dried, I'm going in directly with our lightest color. It's a cadmium red or a, a scarlet red, I apologize for not knowing which, but it's a very bright, uh, cooler, or no, I'm sorry, warmer red, more like an orange. You could even add in orange, but really that depends on how you feel about doing that, what kind of contrast you're looking to build, and also what your reference tells you to do. I'm working carefully leaf by leaf. Now, one of the nice things about watercolor markers, particularly the pigment based ones, is you're not gonna get streaking the way you might get with alcohol based markers. If you're getting streaking with these, they're probably ready to die. They're probably all dried out. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure you cannot refill 
the Albert Durer or the Windsor Newton watercolor markers, which is kind of a big bummer. It would be really cool. I think you can kind of make your own by mixing pigments and water into an empty Molotov, but I've had those die pretty quickly on me. So I'm not quite sure what the secret to their success is other than a really, really good solution where the pigment particles are distributed evenly so they're not gonna clear up, uh, clog up the tips. So you guys might notice I am leaving some highlights, some uncolored areas towards kind of the tops of the leaves as well as along the veins, like the lights are hitting those higher parts of the leaves. If you guys have ever looked closely at a poinsettia leaf, they are progressively more roughly. You have some that are only kind of roughly and then you have some that are basically curly cues all curled up on top of themselves. So it really depends on what kind of poinsettia you're rendering today. So I wanted to loosen that up as well, add an element of chaos, so I spritzed in some water. I'm trying to get the yellow center to bleed out a little bit into the red poinsettia. Now when you spritz water onto your watercolor marker illustration like this, you are going to get some nice color movement. It's also going to increase your dry time, so that's something you just want to keep in mind. The more you spray water, add water, douse water, mop water onto your illustration, the longer it's going to take to dry, especially as the cellulose finally starts to open up and absorb some of that water. So once it dried sufficiently, I'm going in now with Geranium Lake. It's a cooler, darker red color. And I'm starting to kind of indicate some of the shadows on our poinsettia leaves. Kind of the same technique that I use when coloring the green leaves in the background. From that zoom, you can also better see some of the nice chaos I got by spritzing on water. We get some areas where it's more mottled, a little bit lighter. It's a really easy and fun technique to just kind of bring a little extra life to an illustration that might be starting to look a little bit too stiff. And you guys will see me do that a lot on this channel. So now I'm working back and forth between magenta, which is even cooler and maybe a little bit darker, and our geranium lake color. And I'm blending the color back using geranium lake. So some of the techniques you use with your alcohol markers are applicable with your watercolor markers. They just affect the markers totally differently. The science behind them is totally different. So when you're blending with alcohol markers, you're actually pushing the ink to the back or the dye to the back of the paper with water-based markers like these, you're pulling that color into a new area. So you're pulling that darker color into a new area using your lighter color. So now I want to start adding some really intense darker shadows to this poinsettia. So I'm using Winsor & Newton's Red Violet to start sketching some of those in. I'm paying particular attention to where leaves are la or overlapping other leaves since that would cast a shadow. 
So anytime I feel like things are getting just too tight, it's a great opportunity to spritz some water on. And you guys saw me using my hand to kind of mask off areas I didn't want the water to hit. So once it had a chance to dry a little bit more, and there are some wet areas, so we get an interesting technique. I'm splattering in some white gouache, and when they hit those wetter areas, those splatters kind of diffuse out and kind of soften, which makes for a really interesting splatter technique. But I'm basically using the white gouache to add some highlights to the leaves. So I'm adding highlights back along the veins, since that got kind of lost with all the splattering water, as well as along the edges of the leaves that might catch the light. I'm also going to use the white gouache to sketch in some background leaves and just kind of break that background up a little bit. So I had a lot of fun painting this on live stream. It took a little bit longer than I expected, mostly due to dry times. I am painting in Southeast Louisiana, which spoiler is wet like all the time. So even though I have a house dehumidifier running and the heater running and the fan running, dry times can take a little bit longer. So it's a your mileage may vary situation. If you live in a dry area, this is going to dry faster. If you live in a wet area, it's going to dry slower. But I enjoy doing these live streams with you guys. I hope you guys will join me. I've switched my night back over to Friday night, doing it a little bit earlier at 6 p.m. during December. So if you wanna come hang out and draw, paint, color along with me, I've been doing a lot of Christmas themes activ themed activities during December just to kind of share the Christmas spirit since this is the first year I'm not going to be traveling for Christmas. I'm going to be staying in one place and means I can actually make more art during December which I'm really looking forward to because looking back on it I have very little Christmas themed art in my portfolio. But I would love it if you guys would come hang out. You guys can find more information about when I'm streaming and what we're streaming over on the community tab. And I've also got some great holiday playlists from gift guides to help you buy great Christmas gifts for other artists or younger artists in your life. Give the gift, the love of art, to easy tutorials that you can do with younger ones, to more refined, more established, what is the word I'm looking for? More difficult tutorials like this one where we created a beautiful Christmas poinsettia together. So I had a wonderful time doing this with you guys and I hope to see you guys again during another live stream. So here is our inked sketch. Hard to believe that we actually started with this. There was just nothing, no color on the paper when we started. Then we have some washes that apply some color to kind of influence what everything's going to look like later on. We've got our blue background and our yellow mid-ground leaves. Then we've got our mid-ground leaves with loads of color applied as well as a purple wash applied to the red poinsettia leaves to create a tone. Then we have our base colors colored in. We have the start of our red poinsettia, we've got our green leaves, and we've got our blue-green background established. Then we've added white gouache and that really adds a lot to the piece. It adds a lot of liveliness and it also adds a lot of contrast and definition. And then finally, we have our finished poinsettia.